Hello and welcome to NC Exclusive. I am Binga Aburua. Our guest today is the Commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone. He is also President of the Network of Anti-Corruption Institutions in West Africa and an elected board member of the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. As head of the Anti-Corruption Commission of Sierra Leone, his results-oriented leadership has favorably led that institution to unprecedented successes in the fight against corruption with record improvements in all global and local indexes and surveys. He has also won multiple local and international awards, including being honored by the United States State Department as an international anti-corruption champion awardee in 2020 as a lawyer, activist, and human rights campaigner. Our guest is the Commissioner of Anti-Corruption of the Re Republic of Sierra Leone, Francis Ben Kaifala. Thank you very much for joining us on New Central Exclusive. Thank you. I'm very honored and pleased to be here today. All right, so have you here. Now, it's been three years since you took over the Helms of Affairs as the anti-corruption czar uh, in the Republic of Sierra Leone. How has the journey been so far? Well, it's been, as you would expect, uh, leading the fight against corruption in a country where the corruption culture was very endemic uh, before your appointment and the country was performing very badly in all global. In fact, in, 2000, in 2013, Sierra Leone was ranked the most corrupt country in the world. Hmm. And there are many other things, the toxic political environment and, of course, the illiteracy. All these things came together. And then you are appointed to take corruption head on. Uh, it has been amazing. It must have been a resource. very tough job. You know, to very tough is an understatement, but um, it's, it's, it's a combination of everything. It's tough to tough it. But um, focus on the results and other things have kept me going, and of course we are seeing what we can do. And um, I think that uh, three years down the line, I, have, I am now enjoying doing what I have to do. So where would you say Sierra Leone is uh, right now if you look at today, 2021 October and the fight against corruption uh, from when you took over three years ago? Well, I think Sierra Leone is doing very well. We are now one of the really shining examples of a conscientious and serious fight against corruption in terms of what we have done because we built the fight against corruption on the four pillars, prevention, enforcement, and of course, um, uh, public education and other work. But um, it's going so well that we are having remarkable improvements in every index in the world. And, uh, of course, Afrobarometer has confirmed that corruption prevalence has dropped. It was 70% at the time I was appointed. Mm -hmm. It has dropped to 40% in 2020. So these are the kinds in, of things that are showing. Years. Yes, in just three years. And, uh, now, maybe, I mean, some of the improvements have to do with legislation. And talking about legislation, the new Anti-Corruption Act 2019 was given presidential assent uh, by His Excellency President Julius Mada Bio uh, in 2019. How much of a game changer uh, has the passage of the bill been in the fight against corruption? And what are some of the key amendments? You see, the, the, the formula to winning corruption in the country that has endemic corruption is to make corruption uh, very expensive. Okay, it has to be a high risk and a low return venture. So people should not profit from it, but it has to be also risky to engage in corruption. That is the formula as far as enforcement is concerned. So when I became commissioner, knowing this, uh, part of the engagement I had with the president was that, look, the laws we have are not these are the tools that we need. Yeah. So we now need to put before the legislation, look at the loopholes in the current law, how can we make corruption expensive in Sierra Leone? But also, how can we tighten certain loopholes that are making people to have incentives to engage in corruption? And that is what our reform was about. That bill was drafted by me, by my hand, working with my team, and we put it before parliament, and it was tough for it to go through what, what because of how... Some, uh, I'll let you complete your sentence. Uh, yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it has some really, really uh, significant reforms that were there, and you were just about to ask what we were Yeah, the key amendments. One of it was that to make sure that, for example, the judiciary was not ordering restitution. So somebody can steal $1 billion, mm -hmm. And the judiciary fines him fifty thousand dollars. Okay, yeah. so you see. It's not so what we did it, yeah. was the first thing you can do is the, if you find the person guilty, the person has to pay back that money. Okay, but also in addition to paying back that money, you can find. So the country doesn't lose at all because exactly. at the end of the day, we get what we had, and whatsoever fine you give is a bonus. And of course, we increase the the the, the minimum the minimum that you could be fined 
we increased mm -hmm. it from, from 30 million years to 50 million years. We also increased the number of years that you could be in prison. It used to be three years, it's now five years, but it could be as high as possible. So these are some of the reforms. We make sure that we strengthen asset declaration. Every public officer is supposed to declare the asset. And one of the problems we have with the fight against corruption in Africa is that our leaders don't like declaring the assets. Yeah. So when they come into office, you don't know what they have. And when they leave, it's difficult to determine what they have. So that reform made it mandatory. If you don't declare your assets, your salary could be seized. If your salary, even the president, if he does not mm -hmm. declare his assets, his salary could be seized. And of course, your salary could be seized. And after three months, you could be suspended from office. And after six months, you could be removed from office entirely. So these are all some of the radical reforms that we did to ensure that we laid the foundation for reform. But also we included a civil element in the fight against corruption in that it's not always about going to court. We all know that in Africa, one of the problems we have is the judiciary. We cannot shy away from that. Cases clog in courts, cases take forever to finish. So we gave power to the institution to look at certain cases and go after you and take money from you, and you are barred from holding public office. So imagine a politician. Process, it scares yeah. every politician. So we go after you, we take the money from you, and with 10% interest, no, le not less than 10% interest, so it could be 30%, it could be 40% interest, depending on the negotiation to get it from you. But also you are barred from holding public office for a minimum of three years. It could be 10 years, it could be 15 years. So these are all these kinds of radical reforms that we put in place, and it's really strengthening our hand to be able uh, to... And quite it. progressive, and we've seen the results just three years uh, down the line. Yes. Uh, when you talk about fighting corruption in Africa, I do know there's always pushback, and there's a, always a sense to politicize uh, the fight against corruption. I do remember uh, reading uh, John Kithongo's book in Kenya. It's, it's our, our time, time to eat. eat. Yes, and, uh, and all the troubles he had to go through. You know, people set traps. Yeah. It's always, you know, you're using one hand to do this, blocking yeah. uh, the other. Mm -hmm. That brings me to this question. The governance transition team, uh, GTT report, uh, was bold in blaming former president Enes Koroma as directly responsible for the state of corruption and near economic collapse, equated to a national security threat, as uh, said by the current president, uh, President Julius Marabio himself, uh, when the report was officially handed over to him. But the former president has said, you know, this is a witch hunt, and the uh, APC do not see it that way, and considered. Uh, the report a uh, mere witch hunt and political intimidation. As head of Sierra Leone's Anti-Corruption Commission, what is the current status and uh, is the ACC being used to fight political battles and are there sacred cows in this war against corruption? You see, politicians will always be politicians and uh, the fight against corruption has to be apolitical. Um, no matter what you do, you will always have the conundrum where you are blamed for going after the opposition, for example, if even if it's just one opposition leader you go after, <laughs> they will say you are only interested in the opposition. So even what the, ACC, the facts, are the facts and, and evidence are there. So what the ACC has been doing, because, for example, I became commissioner at the time when there was a new government, and then the president appointed me, and of course there was massive corruption in the past regime. So we had to send a strong message that Sierra Leone is ready to move forward better. And you cannot move forward if you do not look into what has happened in the past. So including the former president, as you know, I, we, we, are, we, investi we have been investigating the former president for money laundry. And of course, the time of his interview, it was a whole brouhaha. The whole entire country was brought to a standstill. But still, we interviewed him. And now the case is being considered for prosecution and other members. The, the, the commission of inquiry was set up that probed all ministers. 31 houses have been seized as of last week from former ministers mm -hmm. of government and all these things. But what we have done beyond that is to show that our fight against corruption is not just limited about the past, OK? We have a president who believes in the fight against corruption and has been one of his greatest successes. He uses it whenever he goes. He addresses the UN. He's just coming from Washington, where he was called by the US government as the international anti-corruption champion and things like that. So th there is a lot of capital that he's getting from the fight against corruption. And we are also using that to show that it is not just about him. People in the current government, we have investigated people. For example, his state chief of protocol was investigated by my institution. Mm. And then he was removed from office the moment we brought charges against him. The same thing for, 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 for former ministers of education. We've investigated them. We've investigated the current minister of labor. We've investigated the head of the maritime administration, was arrested and charged to cause his stunning trial. 
the, 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 the head of the maritime administration before her, before him, is also standing trial in the high court. And of course, we have tried high level sitting public servants mm. and people like that in the current regime. So, what we have done, we, did, we went after the past very strongly, but transitioning from the second year, we now made sure that we balance there are still it out. Current we cases of corruption, and there will be incidents uh, of corruption uh, still in the country. Yes. So we are we are trying to make sure that the citizens see that it's not just about the past. That there is a balance between the present and the past. And of course, we too want the past to be held strongly accountable. If not, for example, in the MCC control of corruption scorecard, we were at 49 percent. We were failing when I became commissioner. Okay. In 2018, we jumped to 71 percent. In 2019, we jumped to 79 percent, and then we moved to 81 percent. We are now sitting at 81 percent, and we are expecting to improve when the scorecard comes out next month. So these are all things that show that we, uh, we do not just mean business, because you cannot be, be making such improvements if you are just going after the past. And of course, it comes with a multi-million dollar investment from the U.S. government to the country. Yes. They are trying to pour that into the, the energy sector, which is about $600 million. That could not have, have happened without the fight against corruption uh, being called. Uh, and with a culture of corruption endemic in the country. Yes, yes, because nobody wants to pour money in such a country. But it's because the investors, the, 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 the donors are seeing that really Sierra Leone is, 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 it means business. That is why they are all working to see what can happen to change the story of the country. Okay, Commissioner Kaifala, we'll go on a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll be looking at what lessons uh, uh, the rest of the continent can learn uh, from Sierra Leone's uh, fight against corruption. You're watching NC Exclusive. And my guest is the Commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone, uh, Mr. Francis Ben Kaifala. Africa is rising. Again, we hear our sounds echo on the other side. Afrobeat and Afropop reinvented, hip life brought back to life, new energy infused into Kwaito and Quella. Africa is balling. Every stroke, every shot, every raise, we find our place at the top. Taking the helm of real power, new hopes for democracies. A breed of entrepreneurial tigers, audacious storytellers, and a promising generation raring to go. Truly, Africa is rising. And this is where the stories that define our continent live. You welcome back to NC Exclusive. Our guest today is the Commissioner of Sierra Leone's Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, Mr. Francis Ben Kaifala. Thank you very much for having us. Now, Thank let's you. continue our discussion. Uh, Zambia's new president, uh, President Akainde Hitilema, said that he inherited an empty treasury while horrifying amounts of money had been stolen. We have also seen a lot of top African politicians and leaders named in the recent Pandora Papers as president of the Network of Anti-Corruption Institutions in West Africa, an elected board member of the African Union Advisory Board on Corruption. How big of a problem is corruption in Africa and what makes it so easy for people? We hear the results. Why, is there no, why aren't there preventive mechanisms to stop people from stealing? I think we have to acknowledge that corruption is really one of the biggest problems of Africa. I mean, people, Pan-Africanists will be very, uh, not very happy with the transparency index, but every year when it comes out, we see that Africa is one of the most corrupt places on mm -hmm. earth. And West Africa is the most corrupt of the most corrupt. Mm -hmm. So um, I am operating in this kind of environment, and corruption remains a problem. But what we, why it is a problem is really the absence of a few things. Now, to successfully fight corruption in Africa in every country, there has to be a few things in place. One, there has to be the presidential will. The president has to want for corruption to be fought mm -hmm. and gives his backing for it visibly and mean it. Then there has to be the political will. The political will goes beyond the president. It involves every other actor, including the legislature, the judges. Because you're the, not working in isolation. The, everybody, yeah. yes. Then it has to have the buy-in of the people. Okay, the people have to also support the fight against corruption because you have this situation where a politician is arrested and the people are blocking all the roads and they are the ones they are not willing to testify in court. Then, of course, you have the problem. Then you have to have a strong legislation 
You asked about how we form our laws and to make it one of the strongest legislation in Africa. The laws we have in, Af in, in Sierra Leone, if you bring it to Nigeria, is going to be, I don't know whether the Nigerian Senate will ever pass it because they are so strong. Well, I remember presenting once in Abuja. Well, you get the results. But everybody yeah. was like, really, these are laws in Sierra Leone? I said, yes, we can arrest and detain for 10 days without any charge. Mm -hmm. You do that in Nigeria for such of an of offense, there will be a yeah. lot of uproar and things like that. Then lastly and most importantly, the courage of those fighting corruption. Now, these five things I have named for you, in Africa you will see countries corruption where... corruption fights back. Corruption yes. fights back. So you need to have a lot of courage as an anti-graft campaigner to really take it on. So if you are worried about dying the next day, you are worried about your family, you are worried about losing your job, you are worrying about your salary and things like that, trust me, you cannot succeed. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the five things that have to be present for an anti-graft campaign to succeed in any country in Africa. But if you look at most countries, probably four or three or five of them are absent. So most of the laws are weak. Sometimes the president is not supportive of the fight against corruption. Sometimes the political will is not there. The, the political apparatus is not really interested in the fight against corruption. They are merely hypocritical about it. And sometimes the people themselves are not supportive enough of the general fight against corruption. So if we have to change the story of Africa, we have to work on these five things for it to be there like a minimum content in most countries. You just killed uh, two birds with one stone because you did talk about the challenges uh, facing us and why corruption is such a big problem. Now let's talk about the word corruption itself, yeah. uh, the semantics of it. Mm -hmm. To the ordinary people, when you say corruption, it sounds like, you know, it's high sounding, it's like high big English. And, but when you say this person has gone to thief, you don't thief yeah, money, don't money and those kind of things, yeah. it does have an impact. Do you yeah. think uh, the, the warden in any way uh, does not encourage... I think that is the problem because if you look at the word corruption itself, many languages in Africa, it will be difficult to find a perfect word to substitute for corruption uh, because the word corruption itself is considered to be a foreign concept. And of mm. course, you know how our African traditional leaderships develop. Leaders basically own everything. I mean, oh, traditionally. Yes. It is the modern that is now saying no, it's the society that owns, and the Come leaders have to fit yeah. into it and all those things. So uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to convey, to communicate. But simply put, corruption is used in whatsoever position you have to, to, to selfishly for you to be wealthy wise, you deprive society theft, itself bribery, of its benefits. So it could be theft, it could be bribery, it could be abuse of office, it could be abuse of position, mm. it could be misappropriation, it could be peddling influence, it could be a lot of things. And every country has a right to look at its own culture and traditions and tailor the things that are unacceptable and considered as corruption and then make sure they enforce laws to prevent them from happening. Now, finally, uh, Commissioner, in 2013, Sierra Leone was ranked the most corrupt country in the world. You mentioned this uh, earlier in the course yep. of our interview. Fast forward to 2021. Your president was invited by the United Nations General Assembly to give a talk on corruption. How did you do this? Uh, what lessons uh, can the rest of Africa learn from? Because it's nothing short of a miracle from the Sierra Leoneans' uh, fight against corruption, from the worst country in the world uh, to being the poster child for anti-corruption. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I myself really find this amazing. For example, like I've told you, every country is trying to come to Sierra Leone to study what we are doing in Sierra Leone so that they can go back and implement it to see. Because when you look, I've told you, we move from 49% to 81% in the MCC control of corruption mm -hmm. scorecard. In Transparency Index, we have been moving 10 places in one go, in one year alone. So these things are fascinating. But what the magic, lessons? the lessons yeah. that we can learn from this is that, I have told you, they have to elect a president who really wants the fight against corruption to happen and is, wants the country to benefit from it. Those who are fighting corruption need to have the know-how and the courage to take it on, head on. And of course, the policies have the legislation, the laws, but goes beyond laws. The anti-corruption strategy has to be streamlined in such a way that it fits, still or made to fit the purposes of the country. If you do all these things and all of them click together, and the people buying into what you're doing and supporting. It's a win-win situation. Bingo for the country. Yeah, that's a good place to leave it. Honorable uh, Commissioner, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you on NC Exclusive. Our guest has been the Commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone, uh, Francis Ben Kaifala. We've been talking to him about uh, the country's anti-corruption battle and corruption in Africa. And Benga Aborowa. Until next time on NC Exclusive.